Hello, my friends. I am Corey Shockey. I have the great good fortune to lead the foreign and defense policy team here at the American Enterprise Institute. And the fun of the conversation this morning about this outstanding book, Chip Wars, which has already been shortlisted by the Financial Times as the best business book of the year and got a splashy, magnificent review in Politico yesterday. This book series is sponsored by Ellen, Helen and Edward Hintz, um, who uh, encourage us into conversation with scholars of national prominence on issues and books that are policy relevant for crucial issues. So AEI thanks them for their generous support. And we have the fun this morning of, uh, of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy professor and Jean Kirkpatrick visiting fellow here at AEI, the good and great Chris Miller. He's trained at Harvard and Yale, taught at the new uh, economic university. I've got economic the name wrong. school. New yeah. economic school in Moscow. Uh, was the associate director of the fabulous grand strategy program at Yale, um, and several other accomplishments. And we are here to talk about his excellent new book. So um, let's start with. Uh, the Cold War semiconductor race. So before I let Chris talk, I should say the very best thing about this book is that it's a serious book about technology and innovation and international geopolitical competition. It reads like a gossipy summer beach read. It's <laughs> so much fun. Um, so uh, talk to me about the Cold War semiconductor race and some of the cloak and dagger espionage along the way. Well, well thanks, Corey, for the introduction and for having me. Um, when, I, when I started this book, I'm a historian of Russia by training, and I wanted to write a, a book that explained why it was that the Soviets could make nuclear weapons with great capacity and could shoot the first satellite into space, but could never miniaturize computing power at nearly the same rate the US could. And, and that was important not only for economic reasons, but also for missile guidance reasons, uh, because one of the key challenges of missile guidance is getting a lot of computing power in a very small space to fit in the nose of your missile. Uh, and th one of the crucial technological challenges of the early Cold War was finding ways to miniaturize computing power. And if you think back to images of computers in the late 1940s or 1950s, they're the size of a room. Um, and, and today, you can get you know, a million more times computing on your phone. Uh, and that process began because the Pentagon was pouring a lot of money into uh, new missile guidance technologies. And so the chip was invented in the late 1950s uh, with this use case in mind. The first big order for semiconductors was for the guidance computer in the Apollo spacecraft. Uh, the second one was for the guidance computer on the Minuteman II intercontinental ballistic missile. So there's a deep interlinkage between computing power uh, and missile systems uh, that we forget today. Um, but the US poured a lot of resources into it and poured many of its best minds into this question of miniaturizing computing power and therefore expanding on computing that we have available. And the Soviets tried to do the same thing and, and failed objectively to the extent that by the 1970s they were basically just copying chips that were produced in Silicon Valley and trying uh, badly to produce them in Russia. It was, it was so bad that the Soviets, although they used the metric system in this, across the Soviet Union, they had chip making machines that measured in inches because they were so reliant on copying US chips. And I, one of the arguments the book makes is that you can't understand why the Cold War ended the way it did with the US military victory without taking account of the fact that the US had access to the most advanced computing power and the Soviets were a decade behind in trying to copy what the US was doing. And so when you get to the 1980s and the US is beginning to deploy precision strike technologies across its military, the Soviets are miles behind, and even today they haven't caught up. OK, how about those two defectors? So there, there are some spies uh, in the early days of the chip industry. And, and one of the hypotheses I wanted to test was we know that Soviet spying was critical in nuclear weapons. They had spies in the Manhattan program. They took the technology to the Soviet Union. They were able to jump ahead in nuclear weapons. So why couldn't you do the same thing in ships? Um, and it turns out that there were some spies uh, who uh, had actually worked with the Rosenberg spy ring uh, in the US, so the same group of people who were uh, pilfering nuclear secrets who then defected to the Soviet Union and started building the computer program in the Soviet Union. Um, but spying doesn't really work in an industry where you're getting a doubling of capacity every year or two. So unlike nuclear weapons, where there's been some advances since the 1950s, but actually technology is basically the same. It's, it's so straightforward that the North Koreans can do it. 
Um, <laughs> chips are not like that. Uh, and Moore's law, which is a prediction, not a law, but it said that we get a doubling of computing power and therefore a, a shrinking of the size of components on chips uh, by a factor of two every year or so, means that chips race forward at a, at a, at a rate that far exceeds anything else we're used to. So you know, imagine if airplanes flew twice as fast every two years or the size of houses doubled every two years. Uh, it's sort of hard to comprehend the impact of exponential growth rates, but that's what we've gotten in computing, which is why uh, we've had a billion-fold or so increase in the amount of computing power you can fit in a square inch of silicon since the 1960s. And so if you're spying, you're getting last year's technology, and then you're trying to figure out how to make it in your labs. And so you end up being a decade behind, which means you end up being several orders of magnitude behind in computing. And so spying just doesn't work. We're going to come to what this means for China and the competition. But before we do that, there are so many great character portraits in this book. And I want to draw you out on a couple of them. Bill Noyce. So, so Noyce um, was one of the two people credited with inventing uh, the integrated circuit. He founded a company called Fairchild Semiconductor and later founded uh, Intel, which today is one of the biggest US chip makers. Um, and uh, Noyce was a brilliant physicist. He did a PhD in physics at MIT. Um, but he was really good at thinking about technology. Um, and, and one of the, I think, key takeaways from the book is that there's science, which is an important thing. But great science doesn't get you great technology. Uh, and this is another lesson from the Soviet Union, which had brilliant physicists and won Nobel Prizes in semiconductor physics. Uh, but connecting science to usable technology is something that uh, you need people who think about market applications. And what Noyce realized was that there was a small use case for chips in missile systems, which was important for national security reasons. But there was a huge use case uh, in civilian computers which at the time was a really niche usage, because only a small number of companies could afford computers that were the size of a room. But Noyce saw into the future, saw the exponential growth that was coming, and realized that there would be a time not so far in the future where every company would need a computer, and eventually where every person would need a computer. And he was able to identify this use, and thereby set Fairchild and Intel, the companies he founded, on a pathway to making computing available for everyone for a growing number of use cases. And that was not really a scientific innovation. It was a matching of a scientific advance to a market need in a way that only a successful startup can. Which is another um, marker to lay down about whether command economies or, or state-driven economies can actually mm -hmm. make that match with the same uh, precision, or at least the same churn of success and failure. But before we get to that, let's talk about Taiwan's strategy for the Silicon Shield, because this is one of the most interesting geopolitical choices. It's not a, not solely a technology or prosperity decision. It's a safety decision. Talk us through that. So just to put Taiwan's importance in context, today Taiwan produces 90% of the world's most advanced processor chips, so the type of chips that go in your smartphone, uh, in your computer, uh, in data centers, on cell phone towers. 90% of these processor chips are produced in Taiwan and can basically only be made in Taiwan. Around one third, slightly over one third of the computing power we use each year is produced in Taiwan. And so if that were to disappear, uh, either because of a very bad earthquake or a blockade or a war, uh, it would take a decade to rebuild the ability to produce the chips that Taiwan does today. In fact, to interrupt you, I think I heard you say in one of your interviews that um, an attack on Taiwan that, that destroyed the silicon chip industry would be an economic tsunami so much greater than COVID internationally. Yeah, if, if, if you think, of. yeah, just, just to think through what it would mean to have one third less computing power than we were counting on. Um, next year. It would be basically impossible to buy a smartphone for the subsequent year. So there's a half trillion dollar industry that you just turn off right there. Um, around a third to 40 percent of PC processors are made in Taiwan. So half as many PCs as usual. Uh, data centers are increasingly reliant on chips made in Taiwan. It would be almost impossible to build a new cell phone tower anywhere in the world. without Taiwan. You could go down the list of industries and you'd have a freezing of our ability to produce new technology. Old technology would work so long as you're, you don't drop your iPhone in the sink. Uh, but if you needed a new one, you'd be in trouble. Um, and it, it's not something we could fix in a couple of months or even a couple of years because the capacity that's been built in Taiwan over the past three and a half decades uh, is enormous. It, it, would, it would take a decade, I think, to really replace it. And so we're all, everyone, the US, Europe, China, Japan, the whole world is reliant on Taiwan to produce 
the computing power that we've come to rely on, uh, which gives Taiwan a position of uh, unanticipated influence, um, but also puts the rest of us at great danger if the Chinese mm-hmm. do try something. So how did the Taiwanese government make this bet right? Right At the start of the process, it probably wasn't even obvious that silicon chips were going to be the choke point of a global economy. That's right. And, and typically, industrial policy is, more, is below the Mendoza line, right? Two out of 10. Mm-hmm. Uh, how, do they, what, how did they get this right when so many others didn't? So if you, to understand how Taiwan got to where it is today, you need to rewind the clock almost 50 years. Um, in the, the late 60s, coinciding with the U.S. withdrawal from Vietnam, the beginning of the U.S. withdrawal from Vietnam, uh, the Taiwanese realized that they were less confident in U.S. security guarantees and so wanted to find a way to integrate themselves more fully into, uh, into U.S. supply chains as a defensive mechanism. The rationale was that... Which is a fabulous strategy. <laughs> it's worked very well. <laughs> um, and, and it worked not only in security terms. And the rationale there was that you know, even if the U.S. didn't want to defend Taiwan, it would want to defend Texas Instruments, for example, which has had facilities in Taiwan for 50 years. Um, but also it uh, put Taiwan in a position of producing chips for U.S. tech firms that were growing and growing and growing uh, in prominence. And there's one individual in particular that plays a, a, a huge role in the book and has played a huge role in the chip industry. Uh, his name is Chang. Morris Chang. Um, and, and he's, I think, one of the most interesting Americans of, uh, of our time, a name that most people don't know, but I think we all should. He was born in mainland China, um, fled uh, to the U.S. after the communists took power, enrolled at Harvard in 1950, was the only Chinese student in his class. Kind of an incredible mm. uh, data point on how times have changed. Yeah. Um, and then, but eventually left Harvard because he was too focused on the liberal arts and wanted to get a, a serious degree, so moved to MIT, uh, <laughs> <laughs> where he studied physics. Um, and, and he, uh, after graduating MIT, uh, was hired by Texas Instruments, which was one of the real hot tech startups of its time, uh, and played a fundamental role in building the chip industry at Texas Instruments. Um, until in the 19, uh, early 1980s, TI made a horrible error and passed him over for the CEO job. Uh, he, was, he was second in line and was passed over. And so he left TI. I was looking for something to do. Uh, and the Taiwanese government called him up. And he'd been to Taiwan only a couple times before, largely on Texas Instruments business trips. He had no other real connection to Taiwan. Um, he was born in mainland China and uh, never been there except for uh, on business. Uh, and the Taiwanese government said, we understand you're the most influential or one of the most influential figures in the U.S. ship industry. We've worked with you to set up TI facilities in Taiwan in the past. Would you like a blank check to build a chip industry in Taiwan? Wow. He said yes. <laughs> uh, and, and from that point, uh, the company he's grown, and until recently he was the, the chairman and CEO, uh, has become the world's second biggest chip maker and the biggest chip maker of processor chips, which are the most important ones in many ways. Um, and today that company produces, that single company, not just the country of Taiwan, but that one company produces 90% of the most advanced processor chips. One of the things that's so delightful um, about you and about this book is that you're actually a Russia expert by training. You're not a technologist or a historian of technology. This is just your side hustle. <laughs> um, and, and that's a beautiful story about human potential and about uh, how intellectually interesting you are. Um, one of the really interesting pieces of the book for me is the way you tell it like a story, but that you seduce all of us into understanding the technology. And my favorite example of it in the book is how the Dutch company becomes central to this. And the way you explain the sophistication, you know, 457,000 parts to it. Talk us through how that technology and why it's so central. So in the process of making a chip, uh, one of the steps is you've got a silicon wafer you're trying to carve microscopic circuits onto. And today, the most advanced chips, like in your smartphone, will have 10 billion or so circuits, each one smaller than a coronavirus. Uh, so the, the manufacturing precision needed is, is really extraordinary. Um, and there's a small number of companies that are capable of doing this. Um, and one of the steps involved is shining rays of light onto the silicon wafer to carve patterns in it. There are certain types of chemicals that react different ways with light. Uh, and so you layer these chemicals on a silicon wafer, you shine light through a pattern, and that'll carve patterns on the silicon. Uh, and for a long time, we used normal light uh, to carve patterns. But normal light, the type you can see, has a wavelength of around a couple hundred nanometers, um, which is fine for most of us, but, but too big for chips. 
Um, and so over the past couple of years, we've been transitioning to extreme ultraviolet light, which has a wavelength of 13.5 nanometers. So it's small enough to carve the tiny circuits we need uh, on chips. But producing this light has been one of the greatest engineering challenges. I would argue actually the greatest engineering challenge of our time. Uh, it took 30 years, tens of billions of dollars of investment, uh, a network of scientists from Japan to the US, the Netherlands. And today, one company monopolizes the production um, of this equipment. They have 100% market share, and no one else is going to uh, produce it because it's so hard. Uh, so to produce extreme ultraviolet light and the quantities you need, uh, you need to take a ball of tin that is 30 microns, 30 millionths of a meter wide. You pulverize it twice with one of the most powerful lasers uh, ever used in the commercial equipment. It explodes into a ball of plasma, several hundred thousand degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> you do this uh, hundreds of thousands of times a second, and that releases enough of this light at 13.5 nanometer wavelength uh, to then collect. But collecting this light is hard, because unlike visible light, which you can use a normal mirror to collect, uh, ultraviolet light is sort of like x-rays. It goes through most materials. Uh, so it's hard to actually collect a lot of it. So you need uh, a unique type of mirrors that are the flattest mirrors ever made uh, to collect enough of this light, 13 of them in a system, then direct it towards a silicon wafer. And then finally, enough of this light hits a silicon wafer to carve circuits. Um, so this is hard to do. <laughs> uh, each machine costs $150 million a piece. So it's the most expensive machine tool uh, ever made. Uh, and there's one company in the Netherlands that controls all of it. And without these tools, you cannot make an advanced chip. And parenthetically, how fortunate we are to have the Netherlands as an ally to be able to persuade them not to export these to countries we are worried about their uses of. Well, indeed, indeed. And if you actually look at what it takes to make one of these machines, um, it's, it's assembled in the Netherlands. Uh, and, and there's a, a whole lot of Dutch expertise that goes into it. Uh, but you can't make these machines without a couple of key German-produced components. The mirrors actually are made in Germany, the laser as well, um, but also US-produced components. Um, so the, the chamber in which you pulverize the tin into a plasma uh, came from a company in San Diego that, that ASML bought a couple of years ago. And then another part of the machine is made in Connecticut. Um, so it's a Dutch-assembled machine with some really crucial German and American uh, components. Uh, kind of a great illustration in how complicated supply chains are uh, not just uh, widespread, but really crucial to making equipment like this. You couldn't do it in a single country. It'd just be impossible. Mm -hmm. So let's dial the sophistication of the conversation down a little bit and talk <laughs> about the Idaho potato grower who is essential to this success story. Well, uh, one, of the, one of the interesting things that I, I learned over the course of this speech, which I hadn't really been expecting, was I, I was expecting to find a lot of Silicon Valley entrepreneurs, uh, of which there are many in this story. Um, but in fact, uh, a lot of the key shifts in the industry came when people external to Silicon Valley invested at crucial moments. And one of the, the, the leading US company in the memory chip making business is a company called Micron, uh, which was founded in the mid 1980s uh, in Boise, Idaho, which uh, you might not uh, think of as the natural place to found a, a chip making company given the concentration in Silicon Valley. But there was a potato farmer, the uh, richest potato farmer in the United States, who at one point supplied half of the French fries to McDonald's, that's how he made his fortune, um, uh, who uh, was asked by a couple of local engineers in Idaho to invest in a, a chip making facility. Uh, and memory chips are different than processor chips. They're sort of a commodity market. Um, the, all of the key memory chip makers produce chips that are basically the same. And so there's huge boom and bust cycles in memory chips. And in the mid 80s was a period of bust. Uh, US chip makers were going out of business. There was a lot of competition from Japan. Um, and it was unlike anything anyone in Silicon Valley had seen before. They were used to high value products uh, without huge cycles. But if you're a potato farmer, you are very used to boom and bust cycles because that's exactly how commodity markets work. Uh, and so a business pitch to an Idaho potato farmer uh, worked in a way that it wouldn't have worked in Silicon Valley. And today, one of America's most important chip firms emerges uh, and still is based in Idaho precisely out of that investment. And so I think it's a great story of um, the the, the, the venture capital ecosystem in the US is not just about uh, companies based in Palo Alto. Uh, it's spread much more widely, and you wouldn't have had the chip industry in the shape that it exists today without a lot of important investment in Texas, in Idaho, uh, elsewhere in the country. So it's not just a Silicon Valley story. I think that's wonderful, and that the knowledge of commodity markets was the key linkage. Um, it's an unexpected connection. So my favorite chapter in the book is titled, uh, how Intel Forgot Innovation. Um, talk about this, the story of stalling that they experience and why it's going to be so hard 
for anybody to be able to supplant or replace what gets done in Taiwan. So Intel is the biggest U.S. chipmaker today. Um, it was founded uh, in the late 1960s. At the time, it was uh, one of the, the leading U.S. startups, and it grew to be a um, one of the biggest U.S. firms, and it's been one of the most profitable U.S. firms ever. It's made over a quarter trillion dollars in profit uh, since its founding. It's been profitable every year for the past 30 years. Um, so in some ways, it's an extraordinary success story of American capitalism. Um, when it was founded, it was run by engineers. Nois, uh, who you mentioned, Gordon Moore, who's Moore's Law is named after, and then Andy Grove, who's a longtime CEO, um, were all engineers, physicists or chemists by training. Um, and they built the business. Uh, they, they built the business from the boardroom, but also getting their hands dirty in the technology. Um, and people like Andy Grove, who was the great Intel CEO in the 80s and 90s, he made his name uh, doing chemistry experiments in the production line. Um, over the past two decades, though, uh, Intel, which is crucially important for the U.S. because it's their biggest ship maker, uh, missed a number of key trends in the business. They missed smartphones, which is huge because today one quarter of all chips produced go into smartphones. Wow. It's a shocking number. Uh, they've missed AI. They're trying to catch up now, but they relate to the shift of AI in data centers. And most importantly, they let their technology fall behind TSMCs. And so today, TSMC in Taiwan can produce chips that are substantially more advanced than Intel. They're several years ahead. And several years ahead means uh, very far ahead when you consider that we're still doubling uh, the amount of computing power we put in a chip every two years. Um, so right now, there's a, a, a new uh, team at Intel. Uh, they're going back to the roots and engineers. The new CEO, Pat Gelsinger, uh, is an engineer by training. Had, Worked with Andy Grove before he left Intel for a while. Uh, and so there's some hope that they can turn things around. Um, but it's going to be a hard struggle um, because they need to both turn around their technology and turn around their business model simultaneously while TSMC is going from strength to strength. But the stakes are quite large because although TSMC is now opening up its first facility, or its second, really its second facility in the U.S., but its first cutting-edge facility in the U.S., uh, in reality, most of the advanced processor chip making in the U.S., is still done by Intel. It's less advanced than Taiwan, but it's still the biggest player by far. And even though TSMC is going to build some more facilities in the US, they're going to have a much smaller footprint in the US than they will in Taiwan. So if Intel succeeds in catching back up to the cutting edge, it'll be a, a real change for the industry. I, I, I wish them the most success, but I think we'll have to wait and see what actually happens. So let's talk about China. Um, they are, they have. If Taiwan 50 years ago made a smart industrial policy choice, how do you assess the Chinese government's choices to invest in AI and chip building? I mean, in the book, you describe a sort of Sputnik moment, um, both for China and the US. Let's start with the China piece of it. Um, have, do you think they have it right? What do you, how do you assess the probability of success? How worried should Americans be that a country that is predatory, in, both commercially and geopolitically, is trying to make this great leap forward? I think we should be worried. Um, no one knows how the China's shipmaking ambitions will turn out. Um, we can make predictions, but we're going to have to wait and see. Um, I think the best case is that it's China's Sputnik moment. Um, Sputnik, of course, was intended to be a militarily relevant program and ended up not actually producing durable military advantage. So the, the Soviet Union looked like it was ahead with Sputnik, and then actually it wasn't. Um, so that, that's the best case scenario, is that China looks like it's catching up and then actually isn't. But if there is one country in the world that has a chance of catching up, I think it's got to be China. Um, if you look at the case of Taiwan or South Korea or Japan, there are three examples of countries based in East Asia that have made dramatic technological advances in semiconductors over the past 50 years. Um, and if there's any country that's more central to electronic supply chain than the US, it's China. Um, most chips that end up being assembled into goods, whether servers or PCs or smartphones, are assembled in China. China today spends more money importing chips than it does importing oil. And it has. That's an amazing statistic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And China imports a lot of oil. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, they just import more chips um, because iPhones, PCs, servers, whatever it is, uh, they need to import the chips from Taiwan. Uh, Korea and other countries before they're assembled into an iPhone, for example, and then exported abroad. So today, China is still very dependent. But the fact that chips are going into electronics assembled in China gives China a fair amount of uh, leverage over um, what types of chips are eventually put in your iPhone, for example, or, or your PC. 
Uh, and in addition to that, China is pouring more money into the chip industry than any country ever has in history. Um, it's hard to get exact numbers because it's done at so many different levels in the Chinese government, but certainly many tens of billions of dollars and probably in the low hundreds of billions of dollars over the next decade. So it's a huge amount of spending. So you give some examples in the book, uh, a Wuhan example, other regional examples of where this is failing. Yeah. But um, you can, as of course the technology field knows, you can fail at a ton of things and still succeed. Yeah. How do you assess their progress? And, and I'd like to connect it to this sort of big geopolitical question about do free societies have creative and market advantages that a command-driven economy like the Chinese can't, get, can't experiment as freely, can't fail as freely, can't um, draw the same kind of talent? Yeah, I, th I think the answer is, is yes, we do that advantage. And if you look at the Chinese success rate in uh, investing in chips, the success rate is not that high. They're pouring enough money into it, or maybe that's still OK for them. If you, if you spend 10 times as much money, but your success rate is half as good, you still might end up winning. And so, so that's really where, where my concern lies. In addition, I think the Chinese, they've, for the past couple of decades, had an interesting mix of command and market methods. And they've been shifting more in the command direction the past couple of years under Xi. Um, but they still do have some of the benefits of, of market methods that they retain. If you, look at where, if you look at the electronics industry, that's among the most market driven in China. Um, mm -hmm. Still a big state presence, but it's, it's fairly market driven still. Um, and so assembly, for example, of smartphones and PCs is largely done by, by mostly private firms. And that, obviously, the boundary line in China is complicated, but it's more on the private sector side. Um, so I, I, I do worry that they've got enough of the market to provide some market discipline, coupled with a lot of the state in terms of cash, in a way that lets them have some successes, even if their success rate is pretty low. And I think some worrisome examples of this are uh, in companies we've talked a lot about, like Huawei. Um, Huawei, on the one hand, is still deeply dependent on US technology. On the other hand, uh, its track record at technological innovation is, is not bad. Uh, we've got to admit that. Um, if you look at the chips that Huawei was designing for its smartphones until it was blacklisted in 2020, they were impressive. Uh, they were all done domestically. They were designed domestically, produced in Taiwan. Um, but the domestic design was, was high quality. Um, and China's got chip makers that are still behind the cutting edge, but they're not that far behind the cutting edge. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not implausible to think that they could catch up. So I, I ended my, my research thinking that we needed to have a, a balanced view of this issue. On the one hand, I, I still certainly believe that the US and the, the, the capitalist system is going to have a higher hit rate than the Chinese in terms of our success. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I think we can't just rest on our laurels and assume that we're going to have a high enough hit rate to compensate for the fact that they're going to spend hundreds of billions of dollars trying to overtake us, coupled with the fact that they're going to be pressing on private companies from the US and other countries working in China to hand over technology throughout that process. Um, and those two mechanisms combined, I think, give the Chinese some advantages that we can't just write off. It's such an interesting and important point. And it looks, though, for me, one of the great mysteries about China under Xi Jinping is the, the self-defeating efforts underway. Um, for example, uh, Moderna choosing to forego the Chinese market because China would have required them to hand over technology. Uh, Apple beginning to diversify its production facilities to India and other places. Um, China's crackdown on their own most successful entrepreneurs. Um, What's the argument for those measures? Is it just should we be understanding this is that the primary driver of Chinese behavior is regime insecurity, and they are willing to um, kill the goose that's laying the golden eggs? Or do you see other? I mean, is there a better pattern to explain that? I, I think that's I think that's right. There is a fixation on regime stability. I think also that. In the West, we tell the story of China's economic success for the past 40 years as the party took its hands off the economy and let the private sector grow. I'm not sure that's how the party tells itself, tells, tells the history to itself. I think they tell the story of, we were very smart <laughs> and built this incredible economy the last 40 years by controlling things. 
Um, and so if you tell yourself that you've done a great job the last 40 years through manual control of the economy, um, and if you're someone in Xi's generation who has grown along with the Chinese economy, your career has sort of mapped onto the, the growth of the Chinese economy, I think you probably give yourself a amount of credit. And you have mm -hmm. uh, undue confidence in your ability to manage things. Uh, and so I suspect that's part of the story as to why you see more manual control is because people at the top think they've done a great job, <laughs> even if they're giving themselves too much credit. So let's talk about American responses to the challenge China is raising. Um, you talk some about the CHIPS Act. How'd Congress do? I think overall it's a positive step. Um, I think we, we've got to have a fair amount of skepticism when the government says we're going to spend tens of billions of dollars helping any industry, especially an industry like the chip industry, which is already profitable. It doesn't really need the help in some ways. Um, but in other ways, it, it does. And it's really not the industry that needs help. It's the rest of us that need the help. Okay. Um, the reason is this, is that right now, if you want to build an advanced chip-making facility in the U.S., it costs dramatically more than it costs in Taiwan or Korea or certainly in China. Mm -hmm. And the reason is not labor cost differentials. There aren't actually that many people in a chip facility. It's a lot of machinery. Uh, and those that are, are very well educated. So labor cost differentials are not the reason. It's tax incentives. Uh, it's the cost of land. Uh, it's everything else that goes into uh, to making facility. And it's a lot of government policy. Uh -huh. And what that means is that a key reason why manufacturing of chips has shifted offshore is that it's cheaper to do so thanks to government policy in other countries. Um, now, it would be great if other countries stopped doing that. Um, I think our track record in convincing them to do so is low, <laughs> right. uh, not very successful. Um, and even where we've got friends that are doing that, like in Korea or Taiwan, even if they were to stop, right now the Chinese are doing even more than they are. Uh, so unless you think you can get China to stop its subsidization, which I wish you luck, but <laughs> we're not going to succeed, I don't think, um, we've got to do something in response. Uh, we can't just let the Chinese spend all of this money on building out chip capacity and thereby threatening overcapacity in certain parts of the industry, threatening the profitability of U.S. and other Western firms, and thereby um, throwing the industry into chaos. That's, that's not sustainable for us and at risk giving the Chinese an advantage. So we've got to do something. Uh, what to do? Well, you can try to push the industry out of China um, by cutting off their ability to access crucial machine tools that right now come only from abroad. And the Biden administration is actually taking more steps in that direction, building on what the Trump administration did. Uh, and I think that's part of the story. But I think part of the story has got to be equalizing the cost, so that it's not dramatically cheaper to produce in Taiwan or Korea than it is in the US. And that's part of the goal of the CHIPS Act. Um, why is that important? It's important because 90% of the world's advanced processor chips aren't made in Switzerland. They're not made in New Zealand. They're made in Taiwan. And if there's one part of the world I'm most worried about, other than central and southern Ukraine right now, it's Taiwan. It's just unsustainable. I saw an interview uh, yesterday with the director of Central Intelligence in which he stated flatly that uh, the Chinese government has instructed its military to have the ability to successfully invade Taiwan by 2027. Um, and so to your point about the, the risks the global economy runs by being so heavily dependent. Um, but one of the reasons so you point out in the book that the Chinese government's smart enough to know it can't just try and nationalize production. Are we smart enough to know that? <laughs> um, are, are we, our efforts at friend shoring, shifting production, shifting reliance, um, the Biden administration seems to have a very kind of buy America, everything has to be produced in the US, and just the Dutch example ought to demonstrate that, that that's impossible. Do you think we actually understand that? I, I hope so. Um, I think it depends who you ask. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I, I think in, in Congress, there are certainly people who are pushing for much more of a buy American, which you know, work, that might work in certain industries, but in chip making, it will not work. It's right. just impossible. Mm -hmm. um, the supply chains are, they're not just international, they're international in a way that certain countries have unique capabilities that we can't replicate. Um, I think it's a good thing that the CHIPS bill provides incentives for advanced manufacturing in the U.S. regardless of nationality. So a Taiwanese company building a facility in the U.S. can get funds, a Korean company building a facility in the U.S. can get funds, and that's good because it creates more competition mm -hmm. and holds U.S. firms to account. Um, and so it's, it's not just a handful of U.S. firms. They'll have to produce good technology at competitive prices uh, and thereby be subject to market forces. And that's what we want. Um, that's capitalism at work. Um, 
but are, are there risks that we push too much in the French shoring direction, which actually no one really knows what that word means. <laughs> Does it mean by American? I think that's a real risk, and we've got we've to push against that. I think there's a clear risk in being reliant on China. Uh, there's a clear risk in being reliant too much on production on both sides of the Taiwan Straits. But I'm not worried about being reliant on the Netherlands. And um, so the, the silicon chip industry starts because of military requirements and defense investments. And we're now at a point where military drivers of this are completely marginal to the progress, and yet they are still essential mm -hmm. for military dominance. Um, there, you know, it's a truism now that there's no such thing as a Chinese company that's not a Chinese government company. We have almost the reverse example in the US. A number of Wall Street firms, a number of Silicon Valley venture capitalists, but also producing firms feel they are global and not American. Mm -hmm. um, how do we thread together a sense that doesn't replicate government uh, dictation to these firms, but does move us past the hesitance that, for example, several uh, tech firms have shown about any assistance to American yeah. military production while they are assisting Chinese military yeah. production. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a challenge. I, I think it's, it's somewhat less of a challenge in the chip sector actually than in, um, in the case of, of Google and other firms that have had this issue come to the fore in the past. Um, I, on the one hand, there's an obvious economic reason for every chip firm to be very focused on China, because for most of them, China is their biggest market. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's crucial that they don't anger the Chinese too much, uh, or else they, get, they risk you know, kangaroo court cases, locking them out of their major markets. Um, so that, that's an important dynamic that we've got to manage, and it's a hard thing to manage. Um, but it's also the case that for every chip firm, um, even if China's their biggest market, their key component suppliers are largely American. When well, they're not American, they're Japanese. Um, and so there's a huge reliance on U.S. technology for every chip firm, whether American or not. Um, and because of that reliance, they need to make sure the U.S. government is happy with what they're doing as well. In addition to that, the way that cutting-edge R&D is funded in the chip sector is that a lot of it still comes from the Defense Department and DARPA. DARPA is still a huge player. Um, and it's, it's not so much, so chip companies will spend a lot on R&D for like five years out technology because they can already see the commercial viability. But if you're looking at 10 or 15 or 20 years out, DARPA is still a very big player and the Defense mm -hmm. Department in general is still a big player. And so there's a lot of people in the chip industry who started their career working on DARPA research grants and still have lots of connections um, with mm -hmm. the defense industrial base. And so even though only one or two percent of chips today goes into a uh, a defense use. There's actually a lot deeper connections between the industry at large and uh, and the defense industrial base than you might otherwise guess. And mm -hmm. I think that has actually facilitated uh, the realization in the industry that there's not only commercial ramifications but also strategic ramifications to what they do. And that's understood, um, I think, fairly widely in the U.S. ship industry. I'm glad to hear that. We have a crowded room, and so the rest of the time is going to be yours, my friends. Anyone have questions you would like to ask Chris Miller? If you do, put your hand up, and somebody will bring a microphone to you so that people who are watching online can also hear. Anybody? Yes, ma'am. Hold on. Wait for a microphone. One's being hustled to you. Um, I Please tell us who you are. And if you like, where you work. Uh, my name's Julia Abrahams. Uh, I'm retired now. I could tell you where I used to work, but I don't know. Does anybody care? <laughs> um, my question is, um, in a lot of industries, there's like a surprise technology that comes out of some obscure corner somewhere that um, the mainstream uh, industry isn't really focused on. And I just don't know with... Um, chips, if something could come out of, you know, like um, some some other part of the world, alt uh, not the physical world, the intellectual world altogether, something like, um, you know, people who are working on, I don't know, you know, polymer science or, um, you know, manipulating DNAs, and uh, all this could then be very quickly uh, irrelevant. And I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. 
interesting question. Yeah, there's certainly a lot of research being done on, on, on alternate paradigms, quantum computing, and then um, different types of biological-based computing. Um, I think everyone agrees that they're a long, long way from commercial viability. Even quantum computing, I think we're at least five years and probably a decade away from the first commercial application, which means that we're a long way away from widespread commercial application. So I, I think it's hard to imagine anything displacing silicon-based computing. The reality is that we've spent the last 60 years pouring resources into tools that are specially designed to manipulate silicon. We can do it at the atomic level, basically, right now. It took a lot of investment. We have uh, a whole class of engineers in the US and Japan and Taiwan and elsewhere whose specialization over 60 years has been manipulating silicon. We can do a very good job of it right now. And the reality is that it's going to take a very long time to, for an alternate paradigm of computing to begin breaking in, just because we've become so specialized in our understanding of silicon, our ability to manipulate it, uh, and it's taken so long and, and so expensive that it'll be hard to displace. So um, if I can pile on to that, the point Chris made early on about it's not the science, it's somebody who sees a market opportunity, right? So all sorts of crazy, unexpected, you know, um, cooking gets revolutionized by the space program because we get Teflon out of it. Um, I think you can expect a lot of that kind of perking outward, but as Chris suggests, what it would take to substitute for the silicon chip industry and how, how many other parts of the economy are linked to it, it would have to be a tsunami to displace it. Could I add yeah. one thing to that, actually, Corey? Go ahead. Uh, one of the most interesting interviews I did uh, as part of this book um, was with an engineer who'd done a PhD in, I think, electrical engineering, if I recall correctly, and then went on to work in a chip making company. And, and I asked her, what was the difference between academic life and, and working? And she said, well, academic life is actually really easy because in a lab, you're trying to do something once. And in manufacturing, you're trying to do it billions and billions of times a day. And you can do anything in a lab, <laughs> but it's hard to do something a billion times a day. I think yeah, that's yeah, the key yeah. difference. That's really interesting. Yes, in the back. Uh, Nick Lardy, Peterson Institute. Uh, Intel has spent, in recent years, tens of billions of dollars buying back their shares and paying dividends to shareholders rather than investing in R&D or building up manufacturing capacity. Now they're willing to do some because there's going to be a big subsidy from the US government. So my question is, if they're not willing to invest their money in their industry, why should taxpayers be investing money in their industry? So I think it's actually, I think it's wrong to say that Intel's problem was insufficient investment. I and mean, if you look at the amount of you know, share of revenue invested is R&D. It's been quite high for a long time. The chip industry invests more in R&D than anyone except biotech. And Intel's invested actually a lot. They just invested it badly. Um, so I, I think you often get the criticism from the left. Well, shouldn't we stop Intel from paying dividends or paying their CEOs lots of money because they're asking for taxpayer money? I think that misdiagnoses the problem at Intel. The problem wasn't that they were deploying, that they were, that they were paying dividends. They've, they've had lots of money including in R&D, the problem is that they weren't doing a good job of it. And so the key question is, can they do it more effectively in the future? Uh, not necessarily do they need more money for R&D. For capacity, that's a different question, for manufacturing capacity. Um, you know, as I mentioned, the cost differential manufacturing in Taiwan or Korea versus the US is substantial. Um, and so I don't think we should be surprised when Intel or any other company decides to build more facilities offshore so long as that cost differential remains. And one of the goals of the CHIPS Act is to reduce that cost gap by providing incentives that are comparable to what you'd get in East Asia. It also brings to mind a comment by Steve Jobs in his canonical uh, Wired interview when they asked a, a, a sympathetic interviewer trying to like tee up a softball about how, well, you know, at the time you failed as Apple CEO previously, um, you know, you had one twentieth the R and D money of everybody else, and you can feel Steve Jobs almost levitating out of his chair as he says, "The problem wasn't money. The problem was how we thought about the issue." Right? R and D spending can't save Apple. Only thinking differently and innovating can save Apple. And I think that dynamic matters so consequentially to this as well. Yes, Ben. Thank you. I'm Ben. I have the pleasure to work here at AEI. Um, I'm wondering if you, you had an amazing article in the Wall Street Journal, an excerpt from your book about how Russia can't use many precision guided missiles uh, because of their limits.
in terms of the internationalization of the chip industry, though, it creates different problems. In the past, the Pentagon could buy all the chips it needed, either from the US or maybe from the US and Japan. Uh, and now it's different. Um, the Pentagon is reliant on Taiwan for certain types of chips, um, which creates security supply questions. Can you actually get the chips in case of a crisis? But it also uh, raises more questions about do you trust the chips you're getting? And so one of the uh, key areas of research right now is in verification methods. So you know that if you get a chip, it's going to work the way you intended it to work. And, and just thinking through, how do you do that? A chip has 10 billion or so components on it. How do you make sure each of those 10 billion components functions the way you want it to? It's actually a really hard problem. There's a lot of work going into that exact question right now to make you sure that if you're buying a chip from anywhere, uh, you know that it's going to function the way that it does. And one of the questions that a country like Russia faces is that, of course, they're buying everything off the black market, so they have no idea uh, whether what they're buying is a legitimate chip or something that someone else might have modified along the way. It must be very hard being a, a Russian defense industrial planner, not knowing <laughs> whether your components will work or not. Yeah, so there, it, there used to be a joke that the worst job in the world is the number two in Al-Qaeda, right? It's most dangerous. I'm not sure I'd, be want, I'd want to be running procurement for the Russian military just now. Um, so a couple of great questions from people online. The first also relates to Russia and Ben's question. You talked about the importance of chips to modern economies. How has being cut off from chips affected Russia? And maybe not just militarily, but more broadly in their industry, particularly maybe their oil industry. You know, it's, it's interesting. So for, for Russia, because they, there's not much manufacturing in Russia, most of the chips that Russia consumes are in goods that are already produced in the center of Russia. So uh, Russia consumes a lot of chips in the smartphones that it buys, but all those chips are put in a smartphone in China and sent to Russia. And that's true across most of Russia's economy. Um, so Russia actually imported very, very few chips uh, before the war um, because the chips it was using were imported to China, put in a good, and then sent to Russia. Um, so the, the chip ban has had less of an impact on Russia because Russia actually wasn't importing that many chips. Huh. Um, it'll have more of an impact on the small number of sectors like defense, like uh, the nuclear sector, like space uh, in Russia, where they were actually relying on some domestically produced chips and now they're gonna have trouble producing them. Mm -hmm. um, next question, how, are, how advanced are the chips that the US will be manufacturing in newly announced plants in Ohio and New York? Is this a sign that the domestic chip industry is moving in the right direction? So they, they will be quite advanced. So in New York, I think there's reference to the new Micron memory facility. Micron is at the cutting edge of memory chips. They will be among the most advanced in the world. Um, Ohio is a new Intel facility. I think we're still waiting specifics from Intel as to what exactly they plan to roll out in Ohio, but it will be close to the cutting edge, um, as close as Intel can currently get. Um, so yes, I think it's moving in the right direction in the sense that it's reducing our reliance on chip making along the Taiwan Straits. Um, but alone, that's not going to solve the problem. Um, you know, we're still going to need, I think, more movement to A, defend Taiwan better, B, to diversify supply away from Taiwan, and then C, to make sure that U.S. chip firms are successfully competing with uh, rivals in Asia. So I want to um, draw on your Russia expertise. As you watch, so I was astonished at how bad the Russian military is performing in Ukraine. Ukraine is performing magnificently. This takes nothing away from them. But, but as an armchair uh, watcher of the Russian military, it's genuinely shocking how bad they are. Why are they so bad? Uh, I, I, I think there are a couple of different reasons. I think one is that from the outset of the war, the Kremlin and Putin personally have been meddling in the war planning, in even the tactics, it seems, in, in certain uh, ability areas. of units to surrender. Ability to surrender, uh, which I'm sure the army appreciates uh, <laughs> meddling in those types of issues. So I think the Kremlin meddling is part of the story. I think when we've seen Russia wage war in Syria, for example, we saw a much more limited war uh, than what we see in Ukraine. And Syria was largely successful for Russia, but it was a much smaller operation. And I think a lot of people, myself included, sort of assumed that could scale with some inefficiency, but it would yeah. scale a bit. And that hasn't scaled at all. Uh, the logistics have been a mess has been widely documented. Um, and then third, the Russians haven't learned lessons from their failures. But they've learned them only very, very, very slowly. Um, I think if you look, for example, at how Ukraine was able to use HIMARS systems for several months to knock out Russian ammo depots and command and control centers, they ought to, the Russians ought to have learned that lesson in 
days or weeks, or even yeah. before the systems arrived because the New York Times was reporting that they were coming, yeah. um, and dispersed their command and control and dispersed I agree. Their it's genuinely shocking how unable they are, even as they're losing, to adapt to it. And by contrast, when I was in Kiev a few weeks ago, um, a senior, I asked a senior Ukrainian military guy, what's the thing you guys are doing best? Like, what's your biggest advantage? Um, and he sounded exactly like an American officer because he got a glint in his eye and he said, we're inside their OODA loop, right? <laughs> Which is a, a technical term about your ability to understand what's happening and respond to it. And he said that the Ukrainian military is genuinely surprised at how slow the Russians are to respond, that they don't have tactical reconnaissance, mm -hmm. that, that like basic stuff that militaries have. Okay, you had a question right there. Guy in the white shirt. Yeah. Um, Hold on, microphone's coming to you. Oh, yeah, sorry. Hi, uh, Andrew Fugit, uh, Austin College. Um, can you speak to the future path uh, for uh, application-specific integrated circuits, and if those developments come from uh, smaller, like fabless, fab light firms, or if they're going to come from the larger, like TSMCs of the world? Yes, yeah, so uh, an ASIC is a, a company that's a chip that's designed for a specific company or use case and then produced by uh, a different company. Um, if you're talking about any chip that is close to the cutting edge in terms of um, in terms of its manufacturing, there's only a handful of firms that can do the manufacturing. TSMC does it best and has the most capacity. Samsung does it slightly less effectively and has a lot less capacity. And then there's a number of firms that do it even less effectively and have small capacity. So if you want to produce on the cutting edge in terms of any sort of logic chip, your only option right now is TSMC and a little bit of Samsung. That's the reality. Um, regardless of who you are in terms of a chip designer, those are your two options for cutting edge manufacturing. One of the big shifts that's happening in the industry right now is that there are more tech companies designing their own chips. So Apple has designed chips on its own for, um, for PCs and for uh, iPhones for some time now. And it's widely thought to be one of the reasons why Apple's had such an advantage in the markets that it participates in. But now Amazon, Microsoft, Facebook, Google are all designing chips for their own data centers. And this is a big change. Um, and they're doing this, though, designing in-house and producing largely than exclusively in Taiwan. So we're actually becoming more reliant over time on manufacturing in Taiwan, even as big tech firms become more able to design their own chips. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm Taylor. I'm from American University. So given that Taiwan's defense strategy has been to place itself as a linchpin in the global economy through their near monopolization of chip manufacturing. What do you think their reaction is to the news that the US is gonna try and reduce their market share? Do you think they would have a negative reaction to that? It's, it's clear that uh, Tsai Ing-wen, the Taiwanese president, has been pushing back against the idea that it's dangerous to have uh, as much chip making as we do in Taiwan. You know, she's proposed the idea of the silicon shield, um, which, which many Taiwanese have, which the idea is that Taiwan's so important to everyone, not just to the US, but also to China whose economy would be, uh, would, would be devastated if, 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 if Taiwanese shipmaking was knocked offline, that therefore the Chinese won't attack. And I think that might be right, but it might not be right. Uh, and it sounds a little bit like Angela Merkel's energy strategy vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Right. It, <laughs> the more integrated we are, the less willing Russia will be to do something dangerous. And you know, that strategy hasn't worked very well this year. And so I, I, I hope that the Chinese are more rational and economically focused than the Russians were. Um, but I guess my confidence in that has declined somewhat over the past couple of years. And I think anyone who, you know, for the past 40 years, everyone looked at China and said their primary goal was to maximize GDP growth. And for a long time, I think that was basically true. You could even trace the promotions of provincial governors and whoever had the highest GDP growth in their province to get promoted to pass this. Over the past couple of years, China has not focused on GDP growth. They've pursued zero COVID to the detriment of economic growth. Uh, and they could have got around that just by importing effective foreign vaccines. Uh, so they chose not to do that, which shows, I think, that GDP growth is no longer the overriding factor in Chinese decision making. And if it's not, then our faith in the Silicon Shield has to decline. Uh, and that's where I get nervous. Because even if you put a small probability value on China blockading or attacking Taiwan in the next decade, 10% or 20%, um, the cost, just in dollar terms, set aside the strategic ramifications, set aside the geopolitical factors, just in dollar terms, the cost would be so dramatic that a 10% chance ought to induce you to spend a whole lot of money uh, to deal with the problem in terms of helping arm Taiwan, but also helping secure our ability to deal with the technological shock that would 
accompany it. So that's why I worry about the selling field. So I would add two quick points to that. The first is um, that if you're the government of Taiwan, you actually have to navigate the politics of if you are too strident about retaining your monopoly on chips, you're going to incentivize the U.S. to develop its own and not rely on you at all. Um, and second, it will affect the political calculation of deservingness of defending Taiwan. I mean, the alternative explanation is that Taiwan is now so vibrant, so democratic, and China is behaving in such a dangerous and predatory way that they don't need a silicon shield in order to have not just Americans, but other free countries willing to defend Taiwan's autonomy. So we have time for one more question there in the back. Hi, Claude Barfield, AEI. Uh, in some ways, it seems to me the semiconductor case is maybe the easy one in the sense that, as you so well shown, the security issue is right front and center, and there can, I think, much, there can't be much debate about that. But the administration is talking about replicating the CHIPS Act in other, t in other technological uh, areas. Does that make are we Are we about to go into a situation where we have a whole series of government interventions on other technologies, and you think that makes sense? Hmm. Good question. Well, I think we should be cautious. I, I think the chip industry is in some ways unique. I, I struggle to think of another industry where we've got such concentration in a geopolitical hotspot with such huge economic and security ramifications if it were to go wrong, and such an inability to produce it ourselves or anywhere else. I mean, the chips are kind of unique in that there's an extraordinary monopolization. We, we talk about oil being a strategic commodity. You know, Saudi Arabia produces, I think, around 12% of the world's oil. ASML produces 100% of the world's photography machines, and Taiwan right. produces 90% of the world's most advanced chips. So the, the amount of concentration is so much higher than really any other industry that I, I don't think we can draw parallels between the dangers and the importance that we see in chips with other parts of the tech sector. Or at least I'd want to make sure that those parallels fit before jumping into comparable programs elsewhere. So my friends, I have three things to say in closing. First, um, to express AEI's gratitude to Edward and Helen Hintz for their support of book writing um, at AEI. Second, there are some free copies of books up front. So those of you who made the effort to be here in person, grab a book before you leave. And third, won't you join me in thanking and celebrating the good and great Chris Miller and his fabulous book, Chip Wars. <laughs>